scientists can now produce antimatter on Earth. But it's a slow and costly process. Creating a gram of antimatter would cost more than 60 trillion US dollars. That means it's a bit pricey for our mission. NASA can produce trillions of antimatter protons. That might sound impressive, but it's actually no more than the energy contained in a book of matches. To get to where we need with propulsion, we'd need something that could store maybe a thousand times that. So far, all of Schmidt's concepts have been designed for unmanned probes, which means they're no use for our exodus to another planet. But ironically, in 1957, scientists may have been better equipped to propel us into space than they are now. Project Orion planned a spaceship the size of an ocean liner that would accommodate 150 people. Its motto was Mars by 1965, Saturn by 1970. This was the atomic age, and nuclear explosions were to propel the ship, each detonation bouncing the spacecraft further forwards. Project Orion, you're like a surfer. You would literally surf on the basis of the shock wave created by miniature hydrogen explosions. The scientists staged a test in California in 1959. Being safety conscious, they abandoned nuclear blasts in favor of conventional explosives for the test. Each explosion successfully powered the unmanned capsule upwards. But then came doubts. The scientists began to worry that the powerful nuclear explosions used in the real launch would kill any crew members, or that the radiation from the blasts would damage them. The scientists realized that it was a Pandora's box. Yes, they would open up the secret of the stars, but hey, are we mature enough to tamper with this kind of nuclear fire? They went back to the drawing board. Today, NASA is cautiously revisiting nuclear power, but on a much smaller scale. So nothing can get to Earth too in one lifetime. Generation after generation would need to live on board a ship in the most hostile environment imaginable. Deep space, with no air and no gravity. Just trillions of kilometers of nothingness. How could human beings endure such a voyage? Having made the decision to leave the Earth, and having discovered the right new planet to call home, we'd still have to survive an incredible journey, one full of new dangers. And our first challenge would come almost at once. Coping with the loss of a force that shaped us all our lives. Gravity. On Earth, every movement we make is a struggle against gravity. We need strong bones just to stay upright. And powerful muscles to move us around. It even teaches us what's up and what's down. Jane Houston, you are go for orbit, go for orbit. But when we headed for orbit, we'd hit zero gravity. Floating gracefully, life in space might seem easy. But without gravity, humans are just like fish out of water. Our newfound strength would only be an illusion. In fact, our muscles would be wasting away. To study the effects of reduced gravity, Dr. Norm Thagard took a trip on the US space shuttle. And he noticed that his body altered. His muscles began to shrink. I lost about 20% of the muscle mass from the calf muscles and about 10% from the thighs. And your heart's a muscle, so it will get weaker as well. The absence of gravity weakens our muscles 
and leeches the strength from our bones, because bones stop growing in zero gravity. On Earth, every time we walk or run, the impact triggers fresh bone tissue growth. But in space, that trigger is missing. In 2005, NASA immobilized some volunteers for three months to weaken their muscles and bones. Raising their feet also made blood rush to their heads, as it does in space. A little uncomfortable. It takes a little getting used to. It's hard to sleep at night sometimes. Within days, their bones had become less dense. Pretending to be in space for just a few weeks affected these test subjects. How would they cope if the experiment lasted for a year? I'm trying to enjoy as much of it as I can. Some Russian astronauts have spent that long in space. And returning to Earth, they've no longer had the strength to stand in gravity. If the situation can get that bad that quickly, could humans survive a journey into space that would last for generations? If current predictions are anything to go by, a year into our journey, a young male astronaut's leg might look normal. But underneath, he could have lost 15% of his bone density. And two years later, as we approached Jupiter, a fall could easily result in a fracture. By Saturn, a pat on the back could crush his spine. And there would still be hundreds of years to go. The only solution is we'll have to bring gravity with us. And at MIT, Dr. Larry Young thinks he's found a way to do just that. Why don't we try to replace gravity? Why don't we try to figure out some way of preventing the problem in the first place rather than repairing the damage? His answer is to use a centrifuge. A centrifuge creates its own force. It's not gravity, but resisting that force still stimulates our bones to grow. Our centrifuge would have to be portable, and Young's team has built one small enough to fit on a spaceship. You would not live on it, but you would spin on it, what I call a spin in the gym. So here I am being centrifuged at a modest G level. It's perfectly comfortable. You feel a gentle breeze over, over your feet. It might make you dizzy at first, but just an hour a day would keep your bones strong in space. It's kind of an unusual f feeling because the sensation you get lying here during this rotation is that the entire world is turning around you. But it is a heavy contraption. We'd need something lighter than this, something like the spin cycle. One of young students has designed this bicycle within the centrifuge. Cycling in circles, it's self-propelled, so there's no need for a heavy engine. And it gives the muscles a workout at the same time. It seems possible that we could overcome the immediate effects of zero gravity. But our journey will still last for centuries. Entire generations will have to adapt to work, rest and play in an environment totally alien to humans. <laughs> 